Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Surfside Recovery Podcast. My name is Brian Licata, and we just wanted to let you guys know that if you or anyone is struggling with addiction, to please reach out to Surfside. You can give us a call at 609-709-4205 or visit us at surfside.org and all of our social media platforms. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Surfside Recovery Podcast. My name is Brian Licata alongside Mr. Ian Koch, and welcome back my friend Roger uh thanks for coming back for uh part two my friend how are you doing this morning doing great thanks for having me back there was a lot of there was a lot of response it looks like there was a lot of positive response so I'm, I'm grateful to be able to do these uh to do these yeah awesome man we're, we're happy to have you back uh I know we were talking off air for a minute or two but uh you know Ian and Roger wanted to get into a couple more specific topics so you know with that you guys can kind of go yeah, so I wanted to talk about um, trends. Like Roger, so you're over in Maryland, in Virginia, that type of area, Northern Virginia, Maryland, D.C., Baltimore, right? For the most Correct. part. And your guys' services are cross country, if necessary. Gone as far as Germany to do to do interventions. <laughs> A hell of an intervention. Canada, um, Germany. I think Don, Germany. I think Don's Don's gone to maybe Turkey. You know, we've been in Mexico. I say coast to coast, border to border is our is our footprint. But we've wow. gone to Germany, Canada, Mexico, Turkey. Yeah. You know. So, what are you seeing in terms of like trends in addiction right now? You know. Two years ago, a year ago, fentanyl was killing everybody. Um, have you seen meth kind of get over into the East Coast yet? Like, what you know, what's kind of what are the lot? Of, what are the majority of the calls coming in about? I'm gonna and start has off. It, and and has it switched? Is a long question. And has it switched <laughs> due to COVID? Has has that changed potentially the call volume and shifted that in a, another direction? Okay, there's like 30 questions in there. So I'm going to start. He tends, gonna to, start. He tends to do that, Roger. <laughs> I'm going to start with, let's, let's just start with the trends. Yes, we're seeing, we're seeing an increase in meth. I think we're seeing an increase in meth in a couple of different reasons. One is that it's, it, it's the new crack, right? You can get meth super, super cheap on the streets. Powder cocaine has still relatively stayed about the same price point. And we're seeing people that are now just utilizing meth in ways that we, we I don't think that we have seen in the past. Um, my background was more of a of a crank use in the in the early '90s and late '80s. You know, very dirty, extreme, <laughs> extreme stimulant use for myself and. Um, I think you're starting to see that now with the Adderall Nation that we're seeing. Kids are getting a really big bump and boost from from using this this new meth, the super meth, and um, we're seeing more and more and more of that across all socioeconomic and lifestyle. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys or not. Yeah, it's super yeah, it's super cheap. I know when I lived out in California, it was everywhere, um, and it was you know a quarter of the price that cocaine was. Uh, it was, I mean, you go at any of those cities out on, on the West coast and it's, it's kind of rampant amongst, you know, like any, anything from like homeless people to, you know, people of affluence. And we're, we're seeing it in DC. It's been in DC for a number of years, but we're seeing more in DC in the suburbs around it, Baltimore, you know, and, um, the, the half life of it is, you know, five hours as opposed to five seconds if you're smoking crack, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one thing that we're seeing. We're seeing an uptick of that. And I think it's because of a price point. And I think that um, a lot of these, these younger kids are, they're just prime for stimulant abuse, whether it be starting off with Vyvanse or Adderall and migrating through trends and intervention. Um, it seems like, and I'm just gonna just rip it wide open. It seems like sure. everybody's an interventionist now, right? They have yeah. 
lack they lack skills they lack life experience and really lack of what it what it means when someone comes to you and asks for help contracts with you and then you're not there to pick up the pieces and that's kind of the worst thing as an interventionist that we see is when people begin with a with an interventionist and they come to us and say we tried this once already and it wrecked our family can you put it back together again and we're seeing this and and we're seeing it in treatment centers to where they have their own interventionists on staff and they're rolling it all up and it's just gnarly to think that um, you can bastardize what what we we believe recovery care partner is a critical path mm -hmm. to 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 extend hope to families. When that phone rings, you want to extend hope to the family that there's a possibility that it can change inside their family unit. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in the industry is that they're using interventions now as a ploy to get their loved ones to, to, to get people to come into treatment, right? navigating the nose it's just like it's 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 disgusting i don't do treatment i don't propose to do treatment i'm not a therapist what i am is i'm an interventionist a recovery strategist i fill in the white space around treatment you better have a treatment provider that you collaborate with that you trust that you know you're going to be able to have an open and direct line of communication with them if not the families are going to be spent. it's going to be very difficult to keep them align through this process that's what we believe we believe that we have a family system that needs to be aligned to move forward to begin this work if you're not having that type of conversation up front with the family it's very difficult to do that when you're in the middle of a crisis when they run out of the room if they don't show up the intervention it's hard to, to you know to corral all of that that energy and that anxiousness and that anxiety does that make sense where i'm kind of going with this ian is that yeah, helpful I mean, for you? I, I, yeah, like I, you know, because we see the same thing with, you know, with extended care and sober living, uh, because our model is very, very unique. And quite honestly, there was no, no one used the term structured sober living five years ago. Now. Uh, and then we opened up and all of a sudden now everybody's structured sober living, you know, and um yeah so we've seen we've seen a really similar um a similar a similar trend you know different avenue of service but you know so when we contract when we talk with the family we're talking you know we start to talk about kind of the golden the golden yard right that's the first year in recovery if you can get to a year in recovery you have a 50 50 chance to maybe getting to five years if you get to five years i think the statistic is somewhere around so you have a 70 percent chance of, of having a sustainable recovery for the rest of your life and when you start to talk with families they need to to understand that you're looking at 60, 90, nine months to a year of a continuum that your loved one's going to move through, that you're going to move through with them. And if yeah. you're talking about 28 days treat and street, how, how can they get to understanding the importance of structured sober living and the next steps? You're, on, you're automatically fighting to get to the next step when it should have been, you know, fleshed out at the beginning that this is what the continuum should look like for you. This is what you should be prepared for. Are you prepared to do this? Because when they start to push back at day 21 and they're talking about aftercare planning, the family has their original kind of agreement of what they're willing to do. And what we like to do is we're going to follow clinical recommendation and the family's on board to follow that clinical recommendation. And then we can return back to kind of those, you know, agreements of how well, some, i'm going to engage sometimes with you. clinical the problem so that's that's our biggest problem is because sometimes clinical recommendation is a joke depends right? like where you're going the, right exactly in the state of new jersey in the state of pennsylvania like to be a quote-unquote counselor all you need to do is be a counselor intern and i i bark about this all the time um and you know, that means you sign up to take the CADC classes, you could have a high school diploma and be the quote unquote person giving the clinical recommendation. And, you know, we see it all the time because, you know, these facilities 
um, consistently will say like how, you know, great Surfside is and oh, if, if we have anybody that is clinically appropriate. And I'm like, oh, okay, so that means you have zero men that are 18 to 35 years old. Got it. Okay. Right? Which what it really means is that the truth is they just don't want to make the recommendation. Right? They, and we've seen it, some of these big conglomerates, and there's a whole bunch of them. And, and this, it's almost like the second um, hedge funds get involved into treatment, which is most at this point, um, clinical recommendation turns in to do whatever is faster, get them out of the case manager's office because the case manager is not available service. So if Johnny says, I want to go home, case manager says, okay. Johnny goes back to the therapist and the therapist gives the clinical recommendation and says, well, I want to go home. I don't want to go to any, I don't want to do any long-term anything. And the parents and the family don't know any better. Right. Next thing you know, the therapist is calling the family saying, OK, his discharge date is blank. So that's what it's going to be. Um, and then they go home. And then you're getting a call two years later doing an intervention. I'm getting a call from a family saying that they're broke at this point because they've done seven treatment centers and seven deductibles and, um, you know, all the back billing on the process. And nobody has a clue what's going on because there's a whole bunch of unqualified people running around trying to fill beds. Yep. Do you want me to jump in on that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, it just, it's frustrating. Like it's, it's just, it's just frustrating. You know, I, I, so that's the critical part to where, you know, we talked about an agreement I talked about, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor. And we talked about collaboration, right? So the collaboration is, is that if I'm, it, if I'm not speaking to that therapist while they're through treatment and I don't need that daily check-in, but what I need to know is what's going on, what's being provided. And what I'm finding is that, and I'm going to say some of these conglomerates that you're talking about, they're unwilling to pick up the fight and fight against the denial of the disease. Oh yeah. They, they won't all, have that. All they are is a band-aid. Like that's all, that's all it is. You know, it's like, and, and we have to understand that, that the hospital mentality hospitals are not designed to treat people right like look at look at our country and and this current circumstance of right we got all, we're we're predicting to hit 100,000 people are going to die of covid which is 20,000 more than last year's opiate deaths um that's just opiate deaths nobody wants to talk about you know the consequences oh, of, of of alcohol i know i know i'm and i know uh but but we're talking about 100,000 people. We're also talking about data is starting to show that like 90% of those people have some sort of uh, pre predetermined condition, aka heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, which is are, are the three biggest killers in the world. Yet you don't get treatment for any of those things when you go to a hospital. You get a, a pill so they can turn you around and spit you out of the hospital to manage those symptoms. So you get a symptom to manage more symptoms, to manage more symptoms, to manage more symptoms. And like, we just had a guy with us first three months he was with us going to this APN on, you know, 14, that's probably an exaggeration, seven different medications. And, you know, one day he was pretty frustrated about it. And I said to him, I said, you know, but like, I'm not saying come off your meds. I'm not a medical doctor, but have, have you ever thought of potentially seeing which which pills you could get away without and and if you were to be thinking about doing something like that now may be the time because of how much staff and support we have that if you start to go off the rails we can get you back on the rails and, and get you where you need to be so all of a sudden i get this i get this text message did you tell so-and-so to stop taking all their meds <laughs> i said no i didn't tell them to stop taking all their meds i said what i said and they said, okay, because they don't want to take any meds anymore. And I said, well, that's, you know, if they're going to try that now is the time. Guy's been off all meds for 30 days at this point. He says he feel, feels better than he's ever been. He's got a little bit of a depression. He's probably going to get back on like one pill for depression. But it got to the point where like he's taking this pill for this symptom, this pill for this symptom, and this pill for this symptom. But this pill gives him another symptom, so he's got to take this pill to get at this symptom and then that pill gives him a symptom so then he's got to take this pill 
and and that's what our 30 day treatment centers do is is they they're not they're not digging deep because quite honestly you don't have time to dig deep in 20 something days right it's it's a put a band-aid on get them out the door the best thing that is that is coming to addiction treatment and hopefully within the next two years it's going to be completely all over everything the absolute best thing that is coming to addiction treatment is value-based care right where and brian i'm not sure if you know what this is but but basically the insurance companies don't reimburse the treatment center if the person comes back within 60 days hmm. it is the best thing that is going to happen because i mean you know like both of you know right some people go in and out four times within 60 days I have kids that are asking me what amenities are there. I know. <laughs> like pools. I know. That's yes. The That's the problem. Yes. I had one last two weeks ago that shocked me. He shocked me. He goes, well, if I go to this treatment center, if I go to this detox, they'll fly me down there and they will do this and they will do that. And I go, you know, that's called inducement, right? That's called enticement. And he goes, what does that mean? And I go, it means that they're, they're utilizing things that are inappropriate and illegal. It's called entice. He goes, can I sue them too now? <laughs> I mean, the mentality of, right, what, <laughs> of what we're against is, you know, the revolving charge card, of, which is now your insurance card. And getting back to what you said a second ago is that, you know, we're treating a chronic disease with an acute model of care. And that's, and that's why we're, we're where we are. Yeah. So what, do, so what do we do to change? How do we? It starts with the family. It starts with giving them some, some type of structure and foundation to stand on. And that's what a good, in my book, a good interventionist does. It but what if the them. family doesn't know that? See, right, because this is the thing. You guys, you guys and us, we're like the little guy, right? We're, we don't have, right? There is, a, there is a treatment center that paid one point, or was it two point? It was either two point or $1.5 million for a phone number mm -hmm. because it says 1-800-whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go on the low end. $1.5 million for just that phone number. Like we don't, we don't compete with them, right? When they, when they type intervention, that facility, I know for a fact has three interventionists on staff. They do free interventions, pop people into treatment, you know, and not for nothing. I know the, some of the staff and they're good, they're good people, but like, like how do guys like us compete with that and get an appropriate you know, message and education out to families who legitimately need support. It's because that's not my fight. I can't fight against that. And if I try to fight against that, I spend my energy and time in an unproductive way. Right. I have, I have my lane that I swim in. I see these people. I know these people. We don't refer to those people. You don't refer to those people. And what, what slowly happens is that over in time, they die on the vine. We had one that happened in Maryland, very large investment company made a very large, when I say very large, like probably seven, you know, double, you know, seven figure. And what happens in these investment funds is it's not, it's, 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 it's not an emotional decision. When X meets Y on the graph, they pull the plug. Guess what happened? X met Y and they pulled the plug on like a $20 million investment. Hmm. That's what happens. That's what's going to happen when the returns are not 10 X, yeah. 2X. They're going to go when away. Yeah. And that's, and that's what's happening is like, you know, I'm watching some people that I care about. Um, we had, we had a, uh, this week, we had an executive director of a detox basically say, he said it to one of their staff, which then told me that their clinicians are too dumb to refer to Surfside. The executive director legitimately said, 
their staff is too dumb to refer to us. Like 75% of our guys don't go back to residential treatment the year they admit to Surfside. But your staff is too dumb, too dumb to say to a family, hey, your son might be good at this program. Can you check out the website? Like that's literally what we're dealing with in the addiction treatment industry. It's fucked. There's like no other way to say it. Is it's it's fucked, you know? Um, there's like nothing even to say anymore. I mean, that just that just sucked cry. all the fucking yeah, yeah. air out of the conversation. I'm sorry, but you know, but but you know, so there's certain things, right? So let's get back to what what's happening. So like in Maryland. They, we formulated a DPM LV, you know, a, a professional liaison, you know, group to where they talk about best practices. They talk about efficacy. But they, and how but you see, do here's stuff. the problem. They have that shit in, in Connecticut. They have it in Jersey. They have it in everywhere. And anybody who wants, any Tom, Dick, and Harry is allowed to show up. So, and, and that's what we want, you know? I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of, you know, this is some principles before personality shit, right? Do you want to hold all the good stif- stuff for yourself or do you want to put it out there and say, look, if you want to learn how to do something different, you can come. Yeah. And I think that's the, I think that's the philosophy of the one in, in the DMV is that, look, you know, we have some bad, we, we, we got some bad operators in our area for sure. And um, do we want to, do we want to just tell them that they can't come or do we want to say, you know what, maybe some person will get a seed planted. Maybe they'll go back and they'll say, they'll have that. "Mm -hmm." Maybe not going to do that this time. That's the only way that us small guys can start to do this stuff. Yeah. We got to lead by example. And sometimes carrying the flag is fucking hard and you're going to take it on the chin, but you know what? Joy will come in the morning. Sure. Of course. But you got but, but you got to do it today in order to get it tomorrow. And uh, you know it's hard for it's hard for me when I take a call when when they say so. Oh, uh, you know, if I go with the interventionist there, they're gonna have, they're gonna have a car and come and pick me up within two hours. And uh, you know, I go well. That's your that's your choice. Sure. Hmm. It's it's hard. It's, and, and for me as a small operator, it's frightening. I don't know um, any other way except to say that I stay in my, uh, stay in my swim lane. I try to educate people where I can. I get on family support groups. You know, when they have, when they invite speakers to come in, we do this sort of thing. And I talk about, you know, treatment works. You need to have a continuum of care. It's going to take it's going to take time and it's going to take willingness for the family to participate in it. This is not yeah. get you know, get it out of the house and everything is going to be OK. It's probably going to get worse. Yeah. Um, I will say we um, when it's followed through appropriately. Like recovery is 100 percent impossible. And like that's that's the brilliance of of like what we do, you know, like, and you see it all the time. Like the guys that like go kicking and screaming, um, into treatment and, you know, here they come out on the other side, you know, um, you're familiar. Are you familiar with Jonathan Roush Mm -hmm. up in New York? Yep. He referred a guy down to us guy shows up at the, at the house and says, I'm not coming in. (laughs) <laughs> it's always funny when that out. happens <laughs> and so we said okay you know see ya and and he was shocked because you know jonathan had like thoroughly worked with the family and the girlfriend and the girlfriend was like look if you don't go in we're done like i'll never talk to you again mom was like you go ahead don't leave but i'm not coming to get you so you have no money you got to go figure it out so he comes in well now this kid is like unbelievably you know like a staple at crossfit three times a week you know completed his fourth and fifth step um 
he's one of these guys who's on a couple meds, wants to slowly get off, you know what I mean? Like wants to see where he's at and is and is now in this position of like, I really hope my girlfriend moves to this area because I don't want to leave. You know, like, what was it, Friday, Brian, you missed the camp out or the fire? Not the camp out, the barbecue. Yeah, Friday. We had 50 plus guys out at our camp, you know, residents, alumni, staff, most of our staff are alumni anyway, you know, um, like laughing, joking around, you know what I mean? Like being able to like be together as a group, you know, and the reality of it is, is like, it's an opportunity, you know, like recovery is so much more than, than sitting in group day in and day out recovery is about rebuilding everything you do you know becoming a different person it's a lifestyle yeah and and it's it's an opportunity right like that you wouldn't want to miss um if you can if you can be patient enough uh to let things work right and be patient enough to do a little bit of hard work um so but it but it starts like what you said it starts with that initial phone call with the family and setting those expectations. Cause I'm sure Jonathan was getting phone calls from the mom and from the girlfriend of what to do. Oh, yeah. And that's, and that's the critical part to where, you know, your families should be in contact with you through this whole process to guide them, to be able to backstop them of when it gets thick and heavy. Mm. And that's that's critical path stuff in order to affect change. It starts with the family being able to hold that boundary, yep. maybe for the first time ever. So, all right, <laughs> I'm out of steam. Good stuff, gentlemen. Good stuff. What's up? Yeah. What's up, Roger? What's up with Maryland? How you guys doing on restrictions down there? So our governor has entered into phase one i can't keep track with 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 all these different things are but sure. in in howard county we had a limited that's where i live we had a limited opening um parks are open you know food stores and i think you can get a haircut now some of this other stuff i think montgomery prince george's and and uh and one other ha- are still you know, stay in place, shelter in place type orders because they're still, still so heavy. So Maryland is starting to emerge. I think there's going to be a lot more positive identifications, obviously, because testing is going to become more prevalent. Mm-hmm. Sure. But common sense, wear a mask, wash your hands, and, uh, you know, just keep your, just having awareness it's, about what's going on with you. I was, I was looking at, at numbers this morning, uh, and look, I, I'm not dumb. I keep wipes and hand wipes in my car, Clorox wipes, and I wear a mask and everything. America has uh, three, 328 million people. We've got 1.5 million cases. It's 0.5% has gotten sick. Um, that makes me feel somewhat positive because if I was going to gamble, I would not bet on the 0.5%. That's Um, way under. It's way under. Yeah. They were, they were predicting way more than that. Um, Well, they can't tell. So in our County, our County executive said that he will not open up the County until we are at 6,500 tests per week. You know, inception to date, I think they've tested 2,500 people. Good Jesus. So we're a very small county and population wise, I think somewhere maybe around like 300,000. But let's just take, let's just take Raleigh to New York. Maybe we'll go a little bit further up to the Connecticut. There's something like 30 million people in that corridor, right? That are, (laughs) that is extremely condensed and populated. And, to, and for you to, for me to kind of see why is that's not happening is just because there's no testing. And then we found out that the testing is not valid, right? There can be, the test can be bad, asymptomatic and all this other stuff. I, I don't know. It's just, well, in, uh, in New Jersey, so in our county, Atlantic County, 
there's 263,000 people. The other day when I checked, I think it was like Wednesday. So let's say we bump it up. There was, there was Wednesday, there was like 1,500 positive cases. So figure it's 2,000. I mean, what's the percent? 2,000 of 263,000. It's pretty small in the big but, picture. But I, I don't know. I think, again, I think that number's skewed because that's the only people that have either been confirmed Correct. by symptoms, not by testing. So there's no trait, what's it called? Trace, contact tracing and yeah. testing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There's, yeah. there's none of that. And something well, yeah, like, like Our assistant program director was sick and they refused to test them. We quarantined them for three weeks. Um, and they refused, they refused to test them. We tried to get them tested a couple of times. We eventually did get them tested once they opened up uh, testing for healthcare workers. But at that point, he tested negative. We are, we're, we're under tested. I don't know where the tests are we, until we have a robust testing. And I think Georgia came out with, with one of the first comprehensive and everybody was jumping on them about opening up. But they opened, they had some like reverse 911 app to where if you wanted to get tested, you could text to this number. Someone would contact you, ask you about symptoms. If you pass that screening, they would take you to a testing parameter. And then all that data is being collected now, right? In a, in a sure. mass way to be able to, to get your test results back and why why hasn't that gone national why isn't like there this national reverse 911 or 211 or 811 or whatever, whatever to say i think i have these symptoms and get you scheduled yeah and then you can start to know um yeah so it's yeah it's a mess but sooner than later we'll come down we'll have a coffee I was supposed to be there this week. Over here? Ben, yeah, with Ben was I was supposed to come down this week and see you guys, but uh it's going to it's it'll happen eventually. Well, hopefully yeah, it'll I'm, be warmer when you come up. Sure. <laughs> it all was right, 90 well, here the other day. So I don't know. This well, one this kind of went all over the place on this one. Maybe we can do another one and kind of harness it up a little bit um about uh you know, all things We'll get you back on at the end of the summer and we'll see where we're at, see what's going on. All right. So. Very good. Well, thanks again, Roger. Appreciate your, uh, your, your time. And, all right. Yeah. All right. Be well. Peace, Peace out well. until next thanks, week. Thanks, Roger. You're welcome. See you. Bye. As always, if you or someone you know is struggling, please reach out to Surfside. You can give us a call at 609 709 4205 or get us on the web at surfside.org.